Berlin War broke out in August 1914. One of the first moves of Asquith's government was to appoint a Secretary of State for War. They needed a man that the country would trust and the country would have confidence in. And he was Horatio Herbert, Lord Kitchener. Now Kitchener was not an easy man to get on with. The army didn't like him very much because he was an absolute autocrat. But the problem was that when he was left to his own devices, he was very successful. So Kitchener said to the government, I want my own army. And I'll tell you another reason for wanting my own army, it's because this war is not going to be over by Christmas. It's going to take two or three years to fight it. And so within a matter of days, he was sanctioned formally by the government to raise an army of 500,000 men the men that were proud to call themselves Kitchener's Army. So who were the men that made up Kitchener's Army? Well, they were men that had grown up on the apogee of the British Empire. They had seen it at its very best. They were Victorians, they were Edwardians, and when they were at school, they would have, would have attended uh, every day a flag ceremony where a flag would be raised in front of the school. They would know drill. They would know the identity of their monarch and know to respect them and all that the British Empire stood for. But in 1914, we mustn't forget that all of these men were volunteers. So they went with a sense of duty, yes, that was the, the driving force, but it was also all those men that I've interviewed over the years, they would all recall that when they were going, they felt like they were embarking on the greatest adventure of all time, and they didn't want to miss out. That's why so many men lied about their age. They, they, it was tragic how young some of them were. I was a member of the Mattershaw cricket and football teams, and nearly every member had enlisted. I was only 16, but I tried to join up too. The recruiting sergeant asked me my age, and when I told him, he said, you had better go out, come in again, and tell me different. I went out, came back, told him I was 19, and I was in. What a lot of people don't consider, particularly with regard to rural areas, is that when war broke out, it was harvest time. And you can just imagine a whole lot of Norfolk boys thinking, oh, I'll go and join up. But when they got there, they found that they would only be on a shilling a day. And on harvest time, it was the time of year that they could really earn their money. So it's noted in rural areas, agricultural areas, that men were a little slow coming forward in comparison to the rest of the country in August 1914, their time was September of 14, when we really see the growth of our local boys joining up. So it's September 1914, and you see a huge number of local men joining the colours. We mustn't forget, there already has been quite a lot of lads going here. Uh, so we ended up with no less than three battalions of Kitchener's Army raised here in Norfolk for the Norfolk Regiment. When they are adopted by the regiment, they become known as the 7th, 8th and 9th service battalions of the Norfolk Regiment. And every one of those battalions saw active service on the Somme. Kitchener's army existed at a time when the extant supplies of uniforms more or less run out. So it was a common sight to see men in civilian clothes marching along the streets of Norwich under the guidance of, of NCOs and officers. They also trained out on Chapel Field Gardens, out on what were known as Carrow Fields, where you've now got the Carrow Football Ground. They even had the Carrow Works Clubhouse as a place to have their food. Now after a period of training in Norwich, it was clear that the men were not gelling as a unit. It's the phenomena repeated all the way across Britain in the Kitchener Battalion, so they would send them away to military camps. Don Gray, a private in the 8th Service Battalion of the Norfolk Regiment, wrote back about his experiences. It may interest your many North Norfolk Post readers to know how the men who joined Kitchener's army 
and who are now encamped at Shorncliffe are faring. We are encamped on a plain two and a half miles from Felixstowe. Here we are amongst other camps, the Seventh Norfolks, the Suffolks, the Essex and the Berkshire Regiment. Each battalion is a thousand strong. And we are 12 in a bell tent and we turn in at 9.30 in the evening, having to rise at Ravelli, which sounds at 4.30 in the morning. After a cup of cocoa and a biscuit, the morning sees us marching until 7.45 when we partake of breakfast. Bread, boiled bacon and tea. 9 a.m. sees us at it again. Returning at 12.30, we are quite ready for our dinner. Stew, beef, onions and carrots, potatoes in jackets and bread. 12.45 sees us parading again for drill until four o'clock when we are free for the rest of the day unless we have a night march. When on night march we are forbidden from even talking or smoking and the three hours seem much longer. But it's all in the game so we don't mind. By September 1915, all three service battalions of the Norfolk Regiment were on active service on the Western Front. They were involved in a war that was a stalemate in those tr terrible trenches. And so they had to find all sorts of ways to keep their morale and spirits up. Yes, we have our rum and lime juice, and we get our bully beef, and for concrete biscuits, they break our barley teeth. We get no eggs for breakfast, but the Germans send the shells, and we run into our dugouts and get laughed at by our pals. Just a tiny piece of bacon. Well, for short, we call it ham. You are fighting British soldiers on a one pound tin of jam. Sometimes we get some roti, well, you civic scully bread. It isn't as light as feathers, and it isn't exactly lead but we get it down us somehow, for we never send it back, though it is smothered with the whiskers that get rubbed off the sack. The dirt blows in our dixies, there's dust upon our mitts, so you can really wonder why soldiers are full of grit. But I'm not going to grumble because I'm feeling well and fit, and I have one great consolation that I'm here to do my bit. The men of the service battalions of the Norfolk Regiment weathered a bitter winter of 1915 to 16 on the Western Front. They'd rotated their time in the front line trenches, in and out, in and out, it'd become quite a routine. They'd seen their friends killed by snipers' bullets, minnowerf rounds, drop shots, shell fire, raids, patrols, minor attacks, but it was still a stalemate. And by the time we get to spring 1916, these men want to do something to break out of this. They wanted a big push. They'd had enough. They want something to break the deadlock. And that deadlock was going to be the first day of the Somme, the 1st of July, 1916. There was only one service battalion of the Norfolk Regiment that was to be engaged on the first day of the Somme. That was the 8th service battalion. Their attack was towards the south of the main advance. It was against a place called Montabon. The principles of the attack were clearly outlined in the operational orders. In delivering the assault, companies will push forward to the first objective without delay, to clear trenches lying between this and their own lines, and on reaching this objective will immediately commence consolidation. If a company is held up unexpectedly by uncut wire or hostile machine guns, it should consolidate what it has gained and pass its reserve platoon round to the flanks. Units on either side are to press on without pause until they reach their objective. 
Tragically, all the battalions that went over the top faced a hail of machine gun fire, and the ground was far from easy going. Crater-like shell holes from the bombardment pitted the ground, and many of the barbed wire entanglements that they had been assured by their brigade officers had been cut were found to be intact. But the men of the 8th Battalion, the Norfolk Regiment, pressed on. Private Fred Campling was one of those that went over the top at 7.30 on the morning of the 1st of July, 1916. Bullets were now flying fast and furious. Without wavering for an instant, the lines advanced steadily, preceded by our artillery fire, which was a marvel to us all. Glancing round, I found myself amongst the regiment on our left. Seeking to correct this, I bore off right, crossed the German third line, which, like the others, was proudly demolished and was delighted to see my section commander, Lance Corporal Gulda. Almost immediately, Gulda made the sign for us to get down. Not a moment too soon, for we now topped a rise in the ground and were in direct line of fire of a machine gun traversing from the right. Glancing over my left shoulder, I was greeted by a wave of recognition by the company officer's cook, who had apparently lost his platoon. Almost in the act of conforming to our line, he was shot. With consummate bravery, Gulder crouched down and applied the field dressing, but the poor fellow soon died. Having completed this merciful act, Gulder glanced to right and left, gave the order to advance, having, having observed our left flank making headway. Rising to my feet, I saw Golda was now a few yards in front when he was shot through the head. The 8th Service Battalion of the Norfolk Regiment was one of the few battalions that was fortunate enough to take its objective on the 1st of July 1916. Sadly, it was at a cost. Not as heavy as some regiments, but still four officers and 104 other ranks lay dead and over 200 of the men were wounded. The rescue of the wounded by stretcher bearers went on long into the night after the first day of the Somme. Private Bert Mead wrote back to his father in Norwich. For 13 hours I lay on top with dead German soldiers for company until the arrival of the bearers who carry me to healthier surroundings. From then forward it has been a continual movement of trains and stretchers, calling for indefinite periods at clearing stations and hospitals. I have made the acquaintance of operating theatres, x-rays and dressing rooms. Despite having visions of Blighty, in a few days I have landed up here in base hospital, still in France and it seems likely I shall spend a few months on my back here prior to convalescing in England. The thigh bone of my left leg has been fractured by a bullet which came in one side and exited the other. The wound itself is healthy, but the knitting of the bone will prove a tedious proceeding. I'm a sorry looking specimen, I can assure you. But I'm having all the food I desire and the best possible treatment. So I guess I'm lucky to get off as I have. The fate of many of my friends does not bear thinking about. The first day of the Somme saw Kitchener's new armies engaged in a major action for the very first time. Almost 60,000 British and Commonwealth soldiers were killed or wounded on the first day of the Somme. Although Norfolk men certainly did join their county regiments as the war rolled on, Britain introduced conscription in January 1916. So as each battalion suffered its losses, the men who came as reinforcements came from all over Great Britain. And those distinctive county battalions would never be quite the same again.
they shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. Age will not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them.